an Airwave Media podcast. This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. Introducing DirecTV Stream, the best of live TV and on demand, which means you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. So whether you want to catch the game live or watch the latest blockbuster, they've got you covered. And there's no annual contract. DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Requires high-speed internet and compatible device. Content varies by package and location. Restrictions apply. Sort of the early things that drew me to him as a historical figure is he does have this sort of um, uh, conflicted legacy where in the United States, as you just said, like he's a hero to us. He was just a guy who comes over, helps us win independence, and then is a sort of a friend to the United States from there on out. And there's really no reason for Americans not to consider Lafayette a very positive historical figure. Uh, you go back to France and his participation in the French Revolution and then politics, even uh, for many years and even decades after the fact, um, his record is much more mixed over there. When the first American troops arrive in France in World War One, it's actually July 4th, 1917. And the symbolism is missed on no one. French officials and the U.S. Army, led by General John Pershing, decide that it would be a good thing to march through Paris. Now, these were rough recruits at this time, but they're welcomed. The front lines of the German armies were a mere 50 miles from Paris. The soldiers march through the streets. And then Pershing and his staff visits the grave of the Marquis de Lafayette, just outside of Paris. And those who know their American history know that this was a French aristocrat who came over to the United States and helped us in the American Revolution. Everyone knew the significance. And a soldier who was there describes it as this. As the hour of noon approached, the unforgettable march across the city to the tomb of Lafayette began. As our soldiers almost forced their way through the densely crowded streets, a French airplane flew overhead, acrobatting and following the line of the march for a while, and then disappeared in the distance. Hundreds of people left the sidewalks and rushed forward to shake the hands of the Americans, strangers but friends and brothers in arms. French soldiers on leave, still wearing trench uniforms, stained and dingy from the grime of battle, joined the marching troops on each side in columns and continued for miles. Children ran forward, throwing flowers in front of the marching men from overseas. They were caught by American soldiers who stuck their gay-colored petals in the steel-gray muzzles of their rifles or tucked them in their belts. General Pershing said, The column looked like a moving flower garden. The humbler folk of Paris seem to look upon these few hundred of our stalwart fighting men as their real deliverance. Many children dropped on their knees in reverence as the flag with the stars and stripes went by. But it's at the grave of the Marquis de Lafayette where the real moment happens. And both Pershing and one of his colonels, Colonel Stanton, who had been in the U.S. Army since the Spanish-American War, both speak. But it's actually Stanton's speech that's remembered and even sometimes misattributed to Pershing. Stanton says, Today is the anniversary of the birth of the American nation, a people whose declaration of rights affirms that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. We are a people slow to anger, but unyielding in the maintenance of our rights and national honor. America has joined forces with the Allied powers, and what we have of blood and treasure are yours. We pledge our heart and our honor in carrying this war to a successful issue. So far, it's your usual stuff. Everybody's excited. They're welcoming Americans. I mean, there's nothing wrong almost, this man Colonel Stanton could say. And then he says the words, Lafayette, we are here. Stanton couldn't speak French. He says this in English. It doesn't matter. Enough people know what he's saying in the crowd it found an immediate response. It was almost as though a bomb had been hurled into the cemetery and exploded. A New England woman is there, an artist from Boston. 
She says, I was thrilled. I felt distinctly a quivering of my whole body, as though it had suddenly been struck by some powerful force. It was just like a lightning stroke. A French writer, M. Gaston Rion, who hears the speech, writes it up and writes it as if Stanton spoke French. With those words, la fayette, nos voila. Stanton is mobbed after these words. This is what the soldier says. It crossed the trenches, his words, and no man's land into French territory occupied by the Germans. Lafayette, we are here. A member of an American artillery section, Professor William Briggins of the faculty of Wabash College in Indiana, tells this soldier how he found the words current among the subject French people freed by the Allied victory in 1918. This short sentence became the password of rapprochement between France and her new American ally. We're going to talk today with Mike Duncan, who has written a book on the Marquis de Lafayette. I'm really excited to have him. We've had him on before. He's, of course, a popular podcast host. Let's not delay. We'll get him right on. I'm talking with Mike Duncan. Of course, you know him. He is the podcaster behind the History of Rome and Revolutions podcast, and now the author of Hero of Two Worlds, the Marquis de Lafayette in the Age of Revolution. We're excited to have him on. Mike, thanks for coming on. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Uh, thanks very much for having me again. We uh, enjoyed you when you had the storm before the storm. I mean, that was one of our highest rated episodes. So, um, Oh, fantastic. In fact, I had Chris Matthews on the next time, and uh, he, he didn't even compare. <laughs> I, thought, I thought I was all excited <laughs> about that. and then I got half the audience was probably angry with him or something. Didn't want to. But uh, <laughs> look, uh, you wrote the book, and I think there's a lot of, right in the title that I really wanted to explore, Hero of Two Worlds, because that says something. Um we know, anyone who follows American history knows, you know, Lafayette, a big part of the American Revolution. Got lots of towns called Lafayette or Fayette or Fayetteville and things like that, the park across from the White House. But Hero of Two Worlds, it sounds like you're really making a statement that he's also a hero in France as well as America. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like I didn't come up with uh, with the name Hero of Two Worlds. That mm -hmm. is something that he was called in his own lifetime. Um, when he comes back from the American Revolution and his participation in the American War of Independence, um, he was he was a young, rich noble who had gone off and like performed all these sort of like glorious heroic deeds, um, like helping these these British colonials overthrow their imperial masters. And when he comes back to, to France, he's a very famous and popular uh, uh, liberal social reformer and political reformer and political activist. And it's really quite early in his life that he gets he gets tagged with this nickname, the hero of two worlds, because he was working both in the new world and then coming back to the old world and trying to bring back some of the principles that he had that he had picked up while he was fighting with his American compatriots and bring them back to sort of a very stuffy, traditional and uh, honest quite broken uh, system of, uh, of government that was prevailing in France at the time as, as sort of uh, medieval feudalism was giving way to what we would call modernity. And if I could make like one other point about this that I, I think is kind of hidden in here is that Lafayette is the hero of two worlds um, geographically in the sense that we're talking about the Americas and Europe, like the old world and the new world. But the French Revolution in particular, which he plays a very important role in, um, is the transition from that old medieval world to what we now consider modernity. So the old world temporally in the sense of what came before and the new world temporally in terms of uh, pretty much the, the world that we live in right now to this day. So geographically and temporally, he's, he's existing uh, at the intersection of multiple things. And we talk a lot about Lafayette in our politics. What about you were living in France for a while writing this book, right? Mm -hmm. What's your sense of France today and how they view Lafayette, if there's anything to say at all about it? Um, well, there's, there is a huge difference between uh, the American interpretation of Lafayette and the French interpretation mm -hmm. of Lafayette. And that was actually one of the sort of the early things that drew me to him as a historical figure is he does have this sort of um, uh, conflicted legacy where in the United States, as you just said, like he's a hero to us. He was just a guy who comes over, helps us win independence, and then is a sort of a friend to the United States from there on out. And there's really no reason for Americans not to consider Lafayette a very positive historical figure. Uh, you go back to France and his participation in the French Revolution and then politics, even uh, for many years and even decades after the fact, 
his record is much more mixed over there. Uh, the French Revolution, the, the legacy of the French Revolution is much more muddled um, and something that remains contested territory. I mean, I, like you said, I spent three years living over there. Um, pe- political factions to this very day continue to argue about whether the French Revolution was good or bad, uh, whether Robespierre was good or bad, uh, whether uh, uh, whether the things that happened were progressive or regressive. And what happens to Lafayette in this picture is that because he was simultaneously uh, a liberal reformer who wanted uh, a declaration of rights and a constitutional government, right? He wanted those things. That puts him at odds with conservatives and monarchists and like traditional Catholics who, who want the old world uh, to stay the same, right? So he doesn't want that. So he, he becomes their enemy. But at the same time, he does want to maintain a constitutional monarchy. He didn't think that France was quite ready for a republic yet. And he certainly didn't want to go follow uh, the, the more authoritarian populist Jacobins on their trip as that as the French Revolution be, continues to radicalize in 1792 and 93 and 94. And so he's at, he winds up at odds with both sides, both the right and the left kind of come to hate him. And so as we as as the French look back on their own history, nobody's really willing to defend Lafayette. Nobody likes Lafayette. Um, And so it's up to us Americans, I suppose, to like keep his memory alive, because I think that he he was more important to French history than than the French uh, themselves give him credit for. And he yeah, I know there's a quote that's like he planted his tree in America and he certainly like earns his chops here it was kind of a crazy venture at first right um when he when he came over to join our fight i don't think like at least originally a lot of the french thought that was a a great idea or maybe thought he was a little nuts oh they definitely thought he was nuts um Mm -hmm. and to be perfectly honest he probably was a little nuts um (laughs) he when he does this he is a 19 year old kid who is essentially running away from home there were there were reasons he did that he was very uncomfortable living a life of like an effete noble in Versailles. This was this was not actually uh, the the costume and the mode of conversation and and the mode of behavior that prevailed at Versailles at the at the end of the 18th century. And this is Marie Antoinette's court. You, I think everybody out there probably has some visual of what it was like to live in the court of Marie Antoinette. Mm-hmm. Lafayette was right in the middle of all that. Like he knows Marie Antoinette. Um, they, they hang out together, they party together, but Lafayette's not actually comfortable in that scene. Um, and so he decides, he, he hears about this, uh, this revolution, this rebellion that's happening over in North America and kind of gets it in his head that he wants to break away from this, uh, from this social scene that he's not comfortable in and go make a name for himself, go do something and make a mark on the world. And he does this in defiance of his very wealthy and powerful father-in-law. He does this in defiance of the king, who at least threatens to issue what's called a lettre de cachet, which is um, uh, basically an, an order to arrest somebody arbitrarily and probably if he had been caught thrown in the Bastille as he's trying to make his getaway. He buys his own boat because uh, because they can't find something to charter. So he winds up just purchasing his own ship and sails away to America to make his to make a name for himself. And this, this is all being talked about back in the salons of Paris and Versailles. Like, oh my God, like where's, where's Lafayette gone? He's disappeared. I hear he's going to run away to the new world. And most of them thought that he would, um, that he would fall on his face, that it, mm-hmm. that it wouldn't actually work. Um, and that he would come back sort of a, a humiliated disgrace. And instead he went over there and proved that there was something, uh, uh, that there was something much more to him, that he was, that he was courageous, uh, that he had a a kind of uh, a stamina and a resiliency that allowed him to, to succeed in the American war of independence. So that when he comes back to France, he's not a disgrace. He's not a humiliated, you know, buffoon. He's this, he becomes the hero of two worlds and winds up being a key, uh, a key factor in France uh, joining the American War of Independence, uh, supporting the Continental Army with money and men and guns. And that is ultimately what's going to allow the United States to, to win that war is French aid, which Lafayette is instrumental in securing. Washington sees him in battle and a Brandywine, I guess, is where, where it's really seen. And uh, yeah, he really seems to prove out. Had he had military training? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, the extent of his military training at that point was like two summers as a young officer doing drills, mm. uh, because because one of the things that, that one of the defining characteristics of Europe at this period and one of the reasons he runs away to America 
looking for a place where he can make his mark on the world is that Europe is at peace. Um, the Seven Years' War had concluded in 1763, and the great powers were not really engaged in any military conflicts for about the next 15 years, which is a, a, a rarity in European history for them not to be fighting each other. Um, and so, no, he did not have a great he had he had certainly like the Battle of Brandywine was the first time he was ever under fire. Um, so he had done drills. He had practiced giving orders. He had read military manuals. And when he goes off to Brandywine, uh, he had like that's that's September of 1777. He's only been in the country for about six weeks at this point. Um, and it was a real it was a real test. I don't know that Lafayette himself even knew how he would behave under battle. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've. I've never been under fire personally. No, just on the podcast, just what, yeah, just exactly, on social exactly, media. You know, <laughs> yeah. Just out there on Twitter, you know, <laughs> like, like in the, tre- in the trenches of social media. But you know, uh, if, if I'm honest with myself, I don't know how I would behave or engage yep. being literally shot at. And Lafayette probably didn't know how he would, how he would respond to it. And what he did is when he was under fires, he ran towards the thick of battle, not away from it. He tried to rally the line that he encountered that was starting to buckle under, um, under a, a, a British charge. He was wounded in the leg, didn't even notice that he was wounded. He just kept going. And then even while wounded, and, and Washington had to declare a retreat because the Continental Army loses the Battle of Brandywine, um, you know, he, Washington comes upon this you know, young teenage marquee who has recently been foisted on him they barely know each other and he finds wounded lafayette like trying to rally troops to hold a bridge so that the rest of the army can get away i mean he 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 performs with exemplary service and courage at the battle of brandywine and i think uh he lafayette learned a lot about himself and i think that that's as i said in the book that's sort of where the hero of two worlds legend is born right and it does become somewhat legendary i mean we we, you can't ever deal with these historical figures without things becoming a bit apocryphal and a bit Mm -hmm. hagiographic you know i try to i'm obviously when i write a book about him i'm avoiding all of those tropes but i think that the legend of the hero of two worlds is really rooted in absolute fact all those things that i just described him doing at the battle of brandywine are true it's just what he did um none of it's made up If you're here, you probably think politics could use a lot more context, right? You want more from your news app than the average Joe, right? Okay, let's talk about Ground News app. Ground News is not a news aggregator. It's an app that lets you compare how a single news story is being covered across the political spectrum. If you like My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, you probably like to get a variety of viewpoints. We would like to think so, right? There's a lot of features, and some of them have nothing to do with politics. Like, if you just want to see news from Europe or news from Africa, you can do that with Ground News app. But it also has features. You can see whether there are stories coming more from the left, more from the right, which sources that have those leanings are covering that story and which are not. You hit the blind spot feature, that's going to show you news that might be excluded and you might never see because it's being favored by one point of view or the other. So if you're the kind of person that's open to seeing multiple perspectives on controversial issues, then Ground News is for you. Check out Ground News by visiting ground.news slash myhistory and download the free app, ground.news slash myhistory to download that free app and start receiving a wide news viewpoint. Kind of reminds me of like Theodore Roosevelt, where some of his relatives were goes into the the, the Battle of San Juan uh, Hill, and it's like, you know, everyone's like, "Oh boy, Teddy's talking again," but he really does. He really does brave he, the bullets, and it's a similar thing where there's legend, but mm-hmm. there's also you know legend, but also backing up the legend. Um, but it's a good that you made that point because I do wonder about it. We Lafayette is the symbol of French American cooperation, no doubt about it. Very useful in our politics. Someone starts attacking France, which happens in America all the time. You bring up Lafayette. You know, it's definitely a point to bring up. Does that color it? Does that mean that we're looking at the American Revolution through that lens? Or is it really the case that maybe we don't win this revolution or it takes a lot longer without him? Oh, without, without the French? Without Lafayette. 
Uh, yeah, with with that. So, th- I mean, this is a good question because the, the the big picture answer is that like, does the United States secure independence without French aid? I don't think they do. Right. Certainly no, not at that no. moment in history. Right. You can't beat you can't beat the British Navy without the French Navy. Um, what Lafayette does is secure a level of goodwill and cooperation that might not have happened mm. without him there right by Washington's side, because he's I mean, he's obviously like a sur- he becomes a surrogate son to George Washington um, and Washington becomes his surrogate father. And then back in in terms of like who's running the show in France. Lafayette is personally friends with literally King Louis the Sixteenth. Um, he's in good with the foreign minister Vergen. He becomes very good. He, he forms a very close working relationship with Benjamin Franklin, uh, who is over there trying to secure French aid. Um, when the French come over and begin working this sort of like joint operation with the Continentals, you're talking about a bunch of like Republican, Protestant, British farmers who are now trying to work together with a bunch of aristocratic, you know, Catholic French officers. They don't, they literally don't speak the same language. They don't have the same religion. Um, the British and French have been at odds with each other's for uh, at odds with each other for centuries. There was a lot of mistrust between the two sides. It was, it was one of this, when you look at it, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows and the enemy of my enemy is my friends. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Um, they were on the same side because they both wanted to stick it to the British and that there in line sort of the beginning and end of their understanding with each other. So, but Lafayette is there as a liaison who is able to convince the Americans that the French don't really mean it. And he's able to convince the French that the Americans don't really mean it whenever they, um, whenever they start bickering with each other and whenever they start sort of lobbing accusations at each other and blaming at each other, because a lot of it didn't go well. I mean, the Battle of Newport doesn't go great. The Battle of Savannah doesn't go great. Um, and there was, a, there was a lot of sort of like blame tossing that went around um, in this sort of joint the dual national operation. And so I think Lafayette helped smooth a lot of that over and created a, a direct line from the French joining the war to then the two sides winning the war, as opposed to if he had not been there, like if he had gotten killed at Brandywine, um, you know, that's a good counterfactual. If, if Lafayette gets killed at Brandywine, do the French then go like, ah, we actually don't want anything to do with this. Um, or if he's not there, when they start having these arguments in 1778, 1779, does do both sides ultimately just say like, this isn't worth the trouble. I don't really want to be your partner anymore. Um, Lafayette helps make sure that they stay on the same side until 1781 in Yorktown. Yeah, you see this. I mean, American history, we have people, you have uh, Hemingway goes to, goes to Spain, and many Americans do. You have, uh, the Battle of Britain, you have, uh, Canadian and U.S. pilots fighting, and it always seems to bind the countries a little bit as long as it, as long as it works out well. And there are people that joined in the Kurds. You see, you see that, um, happen, and those are always useful if it works out, promotional. I do wonder, and you, you probably answered my question on this, but I think it's still worth just asking clarifying is it people like Rochambeau or the Comte de Grasse we don't is it is it really like a language barrier or a religious barrier and that kind of cultural barrier that stops us from really shouldn't they be more heroes when we tell American history like these are the French general though with Washington marched down troops to Yorktown to help trap and that's the admiral that helped trap the British fleet but we talk about Lafayette a lot like is it because maybe Lafayette's getting all the press that we don't talk about those other French generals as much who, who helped us. Yeah, well, I think I think the subtle distinction here is that Lafayette is serving as an officer in the Continental Army, mm-hmm. and those guys Rochambeau and De Grasse, um, and then uh, and the and the Comte uh, Comte uh, are members of the French military. They are they are not serving in the Continental Army, and you know Americans like to tell stories about American history that star America. Um, and don't really, we don't really need to refer to the other people who may or may not have been there, you know, helping us get to where we want to go. This is true, you know, in World War II a lot. This is true, certainly in the American War of Independence. You know, the, uh, Americans have a, an insular view of our own history. And so Lafayette is there as a French officer who has done what? Joined the Continental Army. So he's on our side, right? He's with us in uniform. And I think that that's different from somebody like Rochambeau, uh, Destin or de Grasse, who are 
uh, who are in a French uniform and a part of a French army who is there and are really important. And I mean, Rochambeau is super important <laughs> to, uh, you know, he's, he's the one who ultimately convinces Washington it's time to go to Yorktown, man. Yeah, he wanted New York. He probably wanted to, to take New York, which would have been real difficult. Yeah, of course he did. Yeah, but I mean, and this was Washington's obsession. I, I'm actually somewhat sympathetic to uh, Washington's fixation on New York City. I, I don't think that he was, you know, wrong to be fixated on it, but he was so fixated on it that when very clearly the opportunity was arising down at Yorktown, it took him longer to see it than Rochambeau, uh, who mm. was like, oh, no, we're going to go, we're going to go pop Cornwallis down there because he said he's set up shop in a very bad place. And then, of course, once Washington realizes that Yorktown is this golden opportunity, I mean, he, uh, he, you know, as I said in the book, he, he responds to this information with the fervor of a convert. And I think Washington himself deserves a lot of credit for, um, you know, for, for the victory at Yorktown. He wasn't just a, a sort of passive along for the ride while the, while the French sort of carry him to victory. I, I don't think it was that. Mm -hmm. um, it was just that uh, it was just that without those guys, you couldn't have done it. But we, but again, the United States, wants to tell a story of the Continental Army, you know, this, this ragtag group of Minutemen uh, um, being able to take on the largest military in the world without mentioning that there was an enormous French fleet <laughs> that, was, that was hanging out off the coast that wasn't right. letting Cornwallis go anywhere. The more you look at it, it, you never would have been able to, we're fighting an enemy that could land anywhere on a huge continental yeah, exactly. spear when you really can't mobilize that way. And yeah, Washington could split his army up and Nathaniel Green in the south but yeah, the more you look at it, there's certainly no way without that bottle up to achieve that big yeah, I mean, victory. John Paul Jones is a great hero. John Paul Jones cannot single handedly take on the entire Royal Navy. Um, you know, no, no matter how ballsy and gutsy and daring he was. The book is Hero of Two Worlds. We're talking with Mike Duncan. I encourage everyone go out and get it. Let's talk about the uh, Lafayette then in France when he returns with his reputation. And it's just as the French Revolution is beginning and the storming of the Bastille. You know, the story, at least that we were told, is that Lafayette tries to apply some of the things that worked in the American Revolution and the American constitutional ratification process and some of the actions of Washington, like in particular, giving up his sword and making that statement. And he tries to apply that to France and the French Revolution, and it doesn't seem to work out. Yeah, he's he's Lafayette is generally much less successful in the French Revolution than he is, uh, you know, uh, in the American Revolution. That's just true. And the thing is, is that, um, you know, the American Revolution is fueled at least ostensibly and abstractly by these ideals that have been floating around among like sort of all literate, all educated members of, of what we would call like the society of letters, right. Which mm -hmm. uh, exists on both sides of the Atlantic um, in multiple languages, these, these sort of enlightenment ideals that are starting to bubble up uh, as in the terms of the scientific revolution, um, new ideas and political thought and political Liberty are fueling, you know, people like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and George Washington are also fueling lots of reformers, in France. And Lafayette is amongst that group of reformers in France who see, and then Lafayette himself personally participates in, um, uh, uh, being able to uh, 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 have these principles that have just been sort of free, free floating in the air for the last couple of decades actually implemented in the new world and implemented in the United States of America. And then, yeah, he definitely wants to come back to France and with this same group of reformers start putting these principles in practice in their own kingdom. Um, now, Lafayette had a practical view of things. He was not he was not just some dreamy eyed utopian. He was looking and this is actually one of the reasons why he runs afoul of so many people in, in the French Revolution is because he did believe that there were practical limitations to what could be achieved in an ancient absolutist kingdom like France versus mm -hmm. what could be achieved in in a sovereign polity that comes out of the British, um, you know, the British experience on the eastern seaboard of the United States which had some experience with participatory government, right? That, you know, these local town halls, these sort of like Massachusetts town halls, I mean, those two can be romanticized, but there was at least a degree of 
knowing what it was like to do participatory politics in a way that kind of didn't exist in France at the time. And also like being able to just straight up have a republic, not need a king in the way that Lafayette believed that probably France was still going to need a king even after a great reform movement, which is what he was aiming for. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 1780s, him and all these guys are aiming to reform every aspect of the French monarchy, but they're not necessarily, they're not sitting around like, you know, they're not Lenin sitting around being like, I'm going to overthrow the czarist regime. They were sitting around like, we want to reform everything, but there was so much intransigence from the aristocratic elite um, and even from some of the king's own ministers to oppose all of these reforms that eventually the, the, the tension between the reformists and the reactionaries became so acute that it snapped. And that's what becomes the French Revolution. And Lafayette is then plunged into the middle of this thing that he wasn't necessarily intending on creating, but definitely believed was um, a better option than simply continuing on with the same broken system of government uh, that he believed was had been leading France to its ruin for uh, for decades and even centuries. Yeah, I mean, you get the sense that um, uh, that would have been a good evolution if you're going from a feudal system, you're going to have to stop somewhere, and and that uh, a country like France needs a central, at least central government. He actually, I mean, it kind of like panned out to be true because the actual revolutionary councils only last for for some time and uh you end up with either the st- strong man like napoleon or uh or um or another king you know, citizen king yeah or, the- i mean and that's what and that's what happens you know if you you play the french revolution to the end of the tape and you're sitting on you know an authoritarian emperor in napoleon bonaparte um and then there's a restoration and it's not another you know then they then they have um you know in 1848 they they take another crack at having a republic that is immediately subsumed by what the second empire by napoleon's nephew coming back and declaring a new empire and so it's not until 1870 that you finally get to a functional republic um we don't know what it would have looked like had the two sides you know uh sort of settled into what what is known as the constitution of 1791 which is sort of the final fruits of the labor of 1789 which is a constitutional regime with a declaration of rights attached to it which resembles in many ways the constitution that had just been ratified in the united states except that there's still a king except that there's still an aristocracy Mm. um the problem however is that all of those universalist principles that are being stated in that Declaration of Rights, right? uh, all people are free and equal in rights. Um, why do we still have an aristocracy? Why do we still need a king? Especially when it's very clear, and this is true, that Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and the people around them were doing everything in their power to undermine that constitutional settlement. Right? They didn't want it. And so in 1791, as Lafayette is trying to say, you know, we did it, we achieved this constitutional monarchy, neither the monarchist nor the constitutionalists were happy with the settlement, and both of them tried to undermine it. Um, and Lafayette himself becomes, uh, becomes caught in the middle of this, and that's ultimately where sort of he slips and falls out of the revolution, because he was trying to defend something that nobody actually wanted. 20 years ago, the greatest gymnasts in the world gathered to compete for the ultimate prize, an Olympic gold medal. But in the midst of the competition, the gymnasts started falling and falling and falling and no one understood what was happening until one gymnast discovered why. I think we're just all in shock. No part of that was normal. I didn't even know that it could happen. This is Blind Landing, the story of one of the biggest mistakes in Olympic history. Listen to Blind Landing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, I mean, his status from fighting in the American uh, Revolution seemed to get him a position in the leading the National Guard, you know, a military Mm -hmm. position he's looked up to. But that puts him in this middle. I know at one point he has to actually defend the king physically, both from attacks from the radicals and also from those who would like to restore the monarchy. And he ends up with no one liking him. Exactly. And I mean, this comes to there's a thing called the Day of Daggers where, yeah, uh, that it sort of encapsulates what is, Um, What is just sort of the general mood in Paris and in Versailles through these years where, yeah, on the one hand, there's a populist mob 
that is marching around out there that actually that it tries to assassinate uh, Lafayette, I think, on two or three different occasions uh, in the middle of that day, while at the same time, a group of arch reactionary conservative nobles are armed and go down to the Tuileries Palace to try to sort of like rescue the king from the clutches of the revolution. Um, and Lafayette finds himself opposed by both of these sides because he was given, you know, arguably one of the most impossible jobs that anybody has ever been given, which is maintain order in revolutionary Paris, right? That's a very difficult thing to, for anybody uh, to, to, uh, to accomplish. Uh, and I don't know who can actually do the job. They, they gave it to Lafayette because he was the one person. I mean, w- you know, after the Bastille Falls on July 14, 1789, he gets the job as National Guard commander literally the next day um, because they're like, who can possibly take command of this situation? We have these um, sort of spontaneously forming uh, uh, militia units in all the different districts of Paris, but nobody's in charge of it. Who can we possibly trust with this job? And Lafayette was one of the few people with the military experience and the popularity in the streets to be able to command the respect of everybody. And he, I think he does you know, quite well for himself uh, for a couple years. By 1791, it all gets away from him. He winds up overseeing um, I don't think he orders this, but he definitely he was there. He oversaw it and he was the commander. And so he was responsible for it. Uh, what's known as the massacre of the Champ de Mars, which is a bunch of uh, of Republican activists had come together to demand that Louis the 16th abdicate the throne after the flight to Varennes and Lafayette uh, declared he's he's authorized to declare martial law. And when he goes in to clear the people out um, of the Champ de Mars, uh, his troops opened fire on those people and at least 50 people, if not more, were killed. And this is a great blow to his, obviously it's a great blow to his uh, political popularity that he has just overseen the murder of a bunch of people um, who are coming together uh, really to peacefully protest against the king, but not do much more than that. And that's where, that's where he takes his lumps um, because he had been given an impossible job and wound up not being able to, um, uh, to, to do it. And uh, ends up having to flee eventually to, to the enemy, to Austria, uh, thinks he's going to get treated, uh, he's a hero and well-known, thinks he's going to get treated well, and he's put in a jail cell. Yeah, and and his flight, so that happens, like, he runs away, like, everything I just talked about, the massacre of the Champ de Mars is in the summer of 1791, um, but he, reti- he he resigns from the National Guard and winds up then subsequently, within a few months, being appointed as a general in the French armies, just as the, the wars of the French Revolution are getting going, and there is then in the summer of 1792. So like one year later, there's a, there's a massive insurrection in Paris. Those same Republican activists who had been, um, uh, who had been beaten back in, uh, in 1791 are now roaring back to life in 1792, led by people like Danton and Desmoulins and Robespierre. And this time they succeed. They overthrow the king. And Danton, who has, you know, is one of the most famous figures in the revolution, I think, uh, as much as anybody else really defines what the French Revolution was all about in, it, in both its good and bad aspects, because the French Revolution is such a uh, such a conflicted and contradictory event um, that somebody like Danton uh, has all of that contradiction inside of him. Uh, he him and Lafayette have been at odds with each other for like three years, like they don't like each other one bit. And Danton becomes the minister of justice in the new provisional government after the overthrow of the king. And one of the first things he does is issue an arrest warrant for Lafayette. And Lafayette gets this arrest warrant from one of his political enemies saying, come back to Paris and stand uh, and stand before us and answer for your crimes. Well, the crimes they were going to uh, uh, lay on him was the massacre of the Champ de Mars. They were going to accuse him simultaneously of, of treason and murder. And that in the French revolution, you know, you get, you get charged with treason and murder. You're going to get, you're going to get killed. And so Lafayette looks at this arrest warrant and is like, I kind of have to run for it if I'm going to live. So he does. And he crosses the lines into Austria. And like you said, um, he's hoping his, his plan is to sort of be picked up by the Austrians, uh, have them say, okay, well, you're running from the same people we're trying to fighting. So we'll let you go, which is mostly what they had done with French officers crossing the line. They had the Austrians had been positively encouraging the defection of French officers uh, for the past year. And so Lafayette just figures he'll be one of those people. And then he, he was going to emigrate to the United States. He was going to go set up shop, you know, buy a place down the road from Washington and live a, the life of a gentleman farmer. And instead, the Austrians say, no, buddy, you are one of the ones who started this whole mess in the first place. You're the reason the king and queen are in danger. You're the reason this war is happening. And so they they tossed him in a dungeon. 
uh, where he sat for like five years. You know, Lafayette spent Lafayette spent years it, like when people think about, um, you know, an aristocratic European uh, who has been scooped up by the other side and is now a prisoner. You kind of imagine them living under house arrest, like they stick him in some chateau someplace and he's not, you know, he's not happy. He can't leave the grounds and, you know, they're censoring his mail. But mostly he's just like sleeping in a nice bed and, and kind of like tooling around some property. No, this is literal dungeon conditions like dank, like his health collapses. He's in solitary confinement for, uh, I think, over those five years, he was on his own for at least two and a half, if not three of them, like literally just by himself in a cell, like really grueling stuff, like really, really heart wrenching stuff um, that he went through after having fled the revolution. But it's also like those five years of solitary confinement probably um, saved his life because if he had been in France or fallen into French hands, man, they would have they would have chopped his head off. No problem. Yeah, definitely. Given who else they they killed, including some of his relatives, including some folks mm-hmm. that helped us in the American Revolution, and which was went a long way to shock uh, American opinion, uh, he gets out, and it, you know, Napoleon and Lafayette. What can we say about the relationship there, if there is any? Oh, there's a there's a great relationship between those two, and it was it was fun to it's it's a it's a very little you know sort of it's it's an under discussed relationship. Um, that I had a great deal of fun going through sort of like the correspondence between those two and hearing stories about their relationship, because, um, I mean, this, this just picks us up right with him being in prison. The reason he is ultimately freed, uh, from this Austrian prison in 1797 is because this young Wunderkind general, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte has been put in charge of the French armies in Italy and has, you know, Obviously, Napoleon is like a world historical military genius, uh, and he runs around Italy beating the pants off the Austrians. And in 1797 wins the Battle of Rivoli, which opens the road for the French armies to march on Vienna if they want to. And so the Austrian government has to negotiate. And one of the negotiate one of the one of the clauses in the subsequent treaty ending that phase of the war is that the Austrians have to release all their prisoners of state, among whom Lafayette was one of those specifically named. So in the beginning, like Lafayette and Bonaparte's relationship is that Bonaparte is Lafayette's savior. You know, he's writing letters to him right away saying like, oh, my God, you know, thank you so much. You know, we were getting snippets of your progress and we knew that, like, if you won, we would be safe. And so for a number of years, um, Lafayette and Napoleon are on very good terms with each other for uh, for about five years. They're um, you know, they're not close. They're not friends. But anytime they see each other or anytime they correspond with each other, it's all very, very positive. Um, even through the coup of Brumaire, which is Napoleon then seizing power in 1799 from the directory, because it, through those years, Napoleon is saying all the right things. He is saying, you know, I am I am the embodiment of the ideals of the French Revolution without the bad stuff, without the terror that went along with it. So I'm going to bring to France both liberty and order. And I am going to reconcile all of the fissures, all the national sort of wounds. Uh, he's trying to close uh, a long standing division between the Catholic Church and the French Republic. And he does manage to succeed at that. Napoleon goes around trying to sign peace deals with all the other powers of Europe, including the British. And in 1801 and 1802, like Napoleon's looking pretty good. And then once he's achieved all of this, obviously, Napoleon's real final end that he's for himself, at least, always had in sight, even if he was hiding it from people, is then he's like, oh, by the way, I want to be the first consul not uh, elected, but for 10 years. And now I want to be first consul for life. And obviously, Napoleon is reading the life of Julius Caesar and saying, this is who I'm trying to emulate. And when he's when he takes this authoritarian turn. Lafayette is completely opposed to it and is writing him letters being like, you shouldn't do this. You're doing the wrong thing. I don't want you to do this. And then when the vote for the life consulate comes up, Lafayette votes against it, uh, vocally says I'm voting against it. And then the relationship between the two of them obviously deteriorates rapidly. Napoleon holds a grudge against him for the next uh, 10 years. Lafayette has to pretty much lay low. Like Napoleon doesn't mess with him, uh, but he lays low in retirement until 1814. But when then now 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 we're advanced beyond like you know the invasion of russia and napoleon's uh, after having conquered all of europe he's now uh, falling backwards uh from russia and lafayette you know is getting these news reports that that every every week and every month the french army is falling back and falling back and he's like okay well this is it i'm going to go get in the mix of things again and he's among those who will help uh force the abdication of napoleon 
uh, which he does after personal meetings. Lafayette is one of the people who's in the room uh, saying to Napoleon, you need to abdicate the throne after he's been defeated by the Allied armies. Yeah, that's not a part of the story that you hear a lot of. You know, it's not, not, right. not you don't hear a lot about that. Um, this Lafayette, it seems, if those actions come out of a belief in liberty, a belief in a, the American cause that he fought for, he was very much uh, an anti-slavery, and it seems, uh, at least for compared to American opinion on the subject, and was always... Um, pushing us, pushing the United States and pushing his friends, Washington and Jefferson, on the slavery issue. Yeah, Lafayette comes out of the American War of Independence. So like Yorktown is in 1781. Um, And during the war, he was mostly focused on, you know, like obviously military affairs that are right in front of him. He's he's a major general trying to run a war. Um, But he goes, he goes home after 1781 by 1783. So just a couple of years later, he's only um, probably by this point, he's, I think he's like 24 years old. And he has had this sort of epiphany as he reflects back on what he just did and what he hopes the United States is now going to be able to achieve now that they've, uh, now that they've won their independence and are going to get to go do the thing that he hoped that they would do, which is be this progressive force where these, where these social doctrines that had been, um, you know, sort of been in the ether for the last couple of decades would finally be able to, to come to fruition in a real way. He was, he's looking at slavery and, he, and he's looking at this concept of liberty and it's like if liberty means anything, it means that slavery can't exist, right? Literal slavery is the antithesis of liberty. And, you know, I, I make this joke and, and it's not, you know, I hope it's not too, too mean to Lafayette. Um, you know, he was not a towering genius, right? He, you know, George, Thomas Jefferson was kind of was a towering genius and James Madison was a genius. And, um, you know, Alexander Hamilton was these guys are, are off the charts in terms of their IQ and Lafayette. He, he was a smart guy. He was a bright guy, but he never, he never broke the bank like that. And he just couldn't, he didn't have the intellectual uh, dexterity to reconcile saying all these things about liberty and equality while also continuing to run an authoritarian slave labor camp. That is what the American South was at that time. Um, so yeah, he, he starts writing letters to Washington and Jefferson saying, Yes, it's now time for you to free your slaves. Like if this means anything, if, if we're actually going to achieve what, what we all set out to achieve, which we all agreed we were setting out to achieve, which is to create a, a, a land of liberty, then when are we going to free the slaves? Like when are you going to do it? You, 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 are we gonna, how are we going to do it? What's the plan here? And what they wrote back to him consistently and what they would back, write back to him consistently for the next 50 years because he never really dropped – uh, he never dropped this. You know, his his very last meeting with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison in 1824, when they're both they're both about to die. They're all old men at this point. He's still like sitting around having coffee, being like, so when are, when are we going to free the slaves? Right. We need to do this. They're, they're sitting in Monticello and and like, when are when are we going to do it? And, oh, we can't we can't do it quite now. You know, it's not the right time. Uh, we agree it's bad. And we agree that you're a good person for wanting to end slavery, but we can't do it right now which is the consistent story that the founding fathers told themselves and told the world. Um, and so, you know, Lafayette dies with American slavery still in place, but he was always known throughout the abolitionist world, which was kind of an international coalition of activists in France and Britain, in the United States, um, of people who were trying to end the slave trade and then end, and end slavery in its entirety. Lafayette was one of the most famous abolitionist figures and voices. Uh, he's giving his money to this project. He's giving his time, his attention, uh, any, any chance he gets to publicize the idea that slavery needs to end so that we don't have, there's, there's a line in the book so that, so that liberty does not have to blush in the face of black men, right? Which he doesn't he doesn't ever actually see achieved in his lifetime. But I think he participated in the project that then ultimately does secure emancipation. Finally, um, what's the difference writing like a book versus doing a podcast? Like you can't do a transcript transcripts. What we say on podcasts, right? We talk certain ways and it 
doesn't look the same mm-hmm. in print. It's a lot more work doing a book like this, right? Yeah, and I mean, my, I mean, my thing it's it is it's different, but it's not that different because mm-hmm. I I do I do script everything. You know, like my my process mm-hmm. is is I write I write a script and then my when I'm re- quote unquote recording the podcast, I'm reading what I have written. So the difference becomes w- with the podcast. I have a week to write an episode and every so like right now, as I talk to you, I have an episode that's due on Sunday um, that I will have to write and edit and get out the door and then move on to the next episode. So I'm not really able to, to really look back on what I have written before and then massage and, and reword things and rework things so that I can create a total package that is delivered as a total package to the reader or to the listener, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing, I'm doing serial, I'm doing a serialized work. You know, I'm, uh, the, the podcast is very sort of, uh, like, you know, like what Charles Dickens used to do is like write a chapter a month and send it off there. You don't really get a chance at that point to write everything out and then go back and turn it into one continuous, you know, really well polished and refined product, which I, I very much enjoyed that uh, being able to do that with a book is to be able to focus on, is this paragraph in the right place? Is this sentence in the right place? Do I think that something that I said in chapter seven would better be, the reader would be better served getting this in chapter four? Um, Really being able to think about the total package and how it flows and refine the words in a way that like, you know, I'm, I'm constantly under a deadline gun with the podcast. I got to do it and I got to get it out the door. I, I was able to take more time with the book to really refine the language and give it, uh, you know, to the extent that it can have a literary quality, give it a, a literary quality. Um, so I enjoy, I enjoy both very much, you know, having a deadline means that I'm constantly uh, getting the work done. I'm not procrastinating on it because I, I don't have time to procrastinate on it, but doing the, doing the book really, really gives me the opportunity to, to turn it into something, um, I don't know, dare I say beautiful. And I think it is an excellent book. Thank you. And it is Hero of Two Worlds, Mike Duncan. Mike, it's been great having you on. Thanks for coming on. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Thank you very much. We'll we'll have to do it again uh, whenever book number three comes out. And yes, we will have Mike Duncan on again for that third book, or his fourth book. Um... I want to thank Mike Duncan. I want to thank Public Affairs Publishing. They've been very good to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. And you can sign up there if you want to help support us on Patreon. And there's other many, many, many back episodes to listen to. Thanks for listening. Media Podcast.